Coming up on All Nations Church. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit spoke in that environment. Are you coming to church with that attitude? Because the early church practiced fasting. We wonder what was the secret of their effectiveness. They turned the world upside down. Well, here we have it. They humbly waited on God and used the time to minister to Him by fasting and prayer. If you could stand to your feet for the reading of God's Word. Um, if we could get that on the screen. Matthew 17, 14 to 21. We're going to be reading it in the Passion Translation. And if you can read it out loud, there's something very powerful about the declaration of God's Word. So let's read together. They came to where a large crowd had gathered to wait for Jesus. A man came and knelt before him and said, Lord, please show your tender mercy towards my son. He has a demon who afflicts him. He has epilepsy and he suffers horribly from seizures. He often falls into the cooking fire or into the river. I brought him to your followers, but they weren't able to heal him. Jesus replied, where is your faith? Can't you see how wayward and wrong this generation is? How much longer do I stay with you and put up with your doubts? Bring your son to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the boy was instantly healed. Later the disciples came to him privately and asked, Why couldn't we cast out the demon? He told them, It was because of your lack of faith. I promise you, if you have faith inside of you no bigger than the size of a small mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move away from here and go over there, and you will see it move. There is nothing you couldn't do, but this kind is cast out only through prayer and fasting. You may be seated. This kind is only cast out through prayer and fasting. And uh, so like I said, we're moving into our third week of our Daniel fast. And, you know, I, I really believe that uh, you know, this last week, God is going to do a deep work in all of our hearts as he has been working uh, so long. But as we read this passage, it reminds me of the fact that churches are full of sincere people who love God, who study the Bible, but who need things cast out of their lives. Anxiety, uh, you know, uh, uh, depression, addiction, uh, anger, dysfunction. But according to Jesus, there are burdens that will only be lifted. There are wounds that will only be healed. There are strongholds that will only be torn down and habits that will only be broken and devils that will only be cast out when we fast and pray. But you might say, but, but a Christian can't have a devil, right? Wrong. While a believer can't be possessed, they may be oppressed. Okay, and this is why the Bible says we must not give place to the devil. We must not give him an open door or a foothold. Ephesians 4.26 says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. The King James says, Neither give place to the devil, the New American Standard. And do not give the devil an opportunity. You see, it would appear, re reading this, uh, these two verses, that anger, among other things, gives Satan a degree of access to our lives. Let me read this by uh, the, the British uh, Puritan William Gurnall, 1616 to 1679. He's the author of the book, Christian in Complete Armor. And he said this, The more public your place... And the more eminent your service for God, the greater the probability that Satan is at that very moment hatching some deadly scheme against you. I'm not trying to make you paranoid or fearful, but the enemy of your souls doesn't rest. Literally night and day, he conspires to destroy you, your family, and everything that you love and hold dear. Be under no illusions. He is not playing games even if you are. There's no shortage of Christians who are. Bear in mind, he has had literally thousands of years 
to study mankind, to study your ancestors, to study your family and their particular habits and proclivities and weaknesses. And he knows exactly when to attack. Luke 4 and verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptations, he departed from him for a season. The new living. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. And just in the same way as he was waiting for his opportunity to strike at Jesus, so too he is studying you and your weaknesses and your habits and plotting to derail and destroy you. Amen. You see, if you are not saved, he wants to keep you in darkness. If you are saved, he wants to bring you back to bondage. He doesn't have any other plan other than that. And so Acts chapter 7 verse 39 says, But our ancestors refused to obey him. Instead, they rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. The Amplified. Our fathers were unwilling to be subject to him and refused to listen to him. They rejected him and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. You see, with regards to our old life, there has to be a separation because sin and Satan are synonymous. One goes with the other. Amen. And so that is why we can't play with temptation. And remember, just because you haven't gone there physically doesn't mean that you're already not there in your heart. The Bible says in the book of uh, Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. I mean, why is it so easy for us sometimes to judge other people and see what is motivating them and yet be utterly blind to what is motivating, motivating us? Amen. And so don't fool yourself. It's not just an innocent flirtation at work with your colleague who really, of the opposite sex, who really gets you or understands you. Uh, don't play with temptation. Amen. Because it's, it's from hell. Don't be a dummy. Guard your heart and your home in Jesus name. Matthew 15 and verse 19. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile him. And so it's clear that we are in a battle and the choice is simple. Blessing or bondage. And this is why prayer and fasting is key to walking in freedom. Because when we fast, we are focused. When we fast, we are free. Amen. And so again, free from what you might say? Well, free from the distractions of preparing and eating food and, um, and, and, and particularly free from the, the, the impulses of the flesh, the desires and demands of the flesh. And fasting sharpens us spiritually because this isn't the day for us to be doing things in the flesh. We have to be able to discern the difference between good and God. Amen. There are good ideas and there are God ones. And so know this, there is no failure in the Christian life. God only has victory for you. But we need to be able to synchronize our lives, our hearts, our homes to his plan. We need to be able to align our minds with God and we need to drop the stinking thinking. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not for evil to give you hope. And a future. Because God's plans for us are good. And we must settle that in our hearts. And so when you see believers experiencing things that aren't good. Whether it's addiction, divorce, depression, despair, etc. It's an indication that we aren't walking in the fullness of what God has for us. John 10.10. 10, Satan comes to rob, to kill, to destroy. I have come that you might have life. And have it more abundantly. And so it's clear that God's plans for you are good. However, Satan's plans for you are, are bad. And so how many of you can testify after two weeks that you are seeing some changes in your life, no matter how small? Come on, just wave your hand. If you're seeing some changes in your life, amen. And, and uh, again, those changes might be something as small as lo losing your cravings for, for coffee or sugar or, or certain foods or you're finding it easier to pray or study your Bible or even just the fact that you're sleeping better, amen. And so uh, uh, Genesis chapter 32 talks about um, uh, 
Jacob and his encounter with God. And, you know, it says, um, uh, Jacob sent all of his family um, over before him in verse 22. Uh, sent them over the brook. And it says, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And again, I would encourage you, like I said, I know we're going into the third year, third week of the fast, but I'd encourage you to persist. And if you've maybe had a little struggle or stumble, you got up in the middle of the night, you shoved half a cake down your throat, just thank God for the blood and start again in Jesus' name. Amen. It's okay. All right. You know, we, you know, we, we, at times we, we might stumble or whatever, but be encouraged. And, um, and, uh, but Jacob was determined and he said, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And here we have this moment of self-realization where Jacob means deceiver. Jacob gets this picture of himself and suddenly he says, deceiver, that's, that's who I am. And he's honest. And he said, uh, your name should no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. And you, for you have struggled with God and with men and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked saying, what is your name, I pray? And he said, what does he ask about my name? And he blessed him there. Hallelujah. Praise God. You see, God blesses us in that place where we prevail. And like I said, for some of you, you're not going to see the effect or the change um, or the benefit of this fast until it's over. Because some of you, when you come out of this fast, you're not going to have that same compulsion for coffee or chocolate or sweets or all of these other things that are poisoning you. Okay, for some of you, you may feel a greater freedom in your prayer life, or maybe you've had a, a breakthrough in some area of your life, in your marriage, your finances, whatever. You know, God is a God of breakthrough, and we're starting this year because we're believing for breakthroughs. Fact is, uh, you know, when that lady there, that, you know, dictator over New Zealand retire, uh, resigned, I have to say, it gave me a, a certain sense of happiness. A we brought down one government already in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. First of many. Glory to God. We, uh, I, I'm believing we're going to see uh, politicians that are going to start representing the interests of their people and not being sold out to these soulless, globalist entities that are looking to, uh, you know, uh, institute uh, what, what in essence is an antichrist agenda. Okay? And so, uh, anyway, Jacob was left alone because sometimes we need to make changes to our schedules and our habits in order to facilitate and to accommodate what God wants to do in our lives. Jacob sent his family, everyone he loved ahead of him. He was left alone and that's where God dealt with him. And so anyway, exactly what change does fasting facilitate in our lives? The first one is humility. You say, oh, pastor, please don't go back there again. No, I think some of you need to hear it because this is my third week speaking on humility and some people are completely impervious to it. They're saying, he really needs to hear that. My wife really needs to hear that. And you don't realize the pastor is speaking to you. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, he's actually talking to you, you know. <laughs> humility, Psalm 25 and 9. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. God won't guide you if you refuse to humble yourself. God doesn't guide proud, arrogant, self-centered, self-reliant people. Because ability is no substitute for humility. You may have all of the ability in the world, but if you don't have humility, you don't have usability. Okay? You may be the most talented, qualified, capable, intelligent person in the room, but God will pass over you every single time if you have pride in your heart. James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he said, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And IV, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So if God is resisting or opposing you, it doesn't matter how hard you try, failure is inevitable. Failure is guaranteed if God is against you. And be assured of this. If you are proud, God is opposing you. James 4.10 in the Amplified. Humble yourselves with an attitude of repentance and insignificance in the presence of the Lord. And he will exalt you. He will lift you up. And he will give you purpose. You see, when we fast, we are humbling ourselves before God. We are acknowledging we don't have all the answers, but that he does. Because humility comes 
before destiny. And this is why many believers never reach their destination or their destiny. It's because they're not humble. Humility, again, to be part of a local body. To submit to a pastor and to serve in a local church. Hebrews 13 and verse 17 addresses uh, this very thing. And it says, um, praise you Jesus. Hebrews 13 and verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. For they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. For that would be unprofitable for you. I appreciate in our narcissistic world, this seems like an almost alien concept. Take advice from a pastor. Be submissive. That sounds like something out of the Middle Ages. <laughs> Obey? No way. <laughs> Greet people at the door? Moi? <laughs> no thank you. You want me to teach the children when I've been called as a prophet to the nations? <laughs> if you're too big to do a little thing, you're too little to do a big thing. Luke 16 and 10. If you're faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. You see, we all need to belong to a local body. The balance to this is, however, ask God to plant you in a good church where they love God, where they teach the Bible, and where the pastor isn't a moron. Because it's very difficult to submit to a, a, a minister that has fostered a, a, a dysfunctional, controlling, toxic environment. And to be honest, it's inadvisable to do so. And so humility. Secondly, holiness. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 6.19, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this is why we need to keep it clean. Amen. And not just physically, but spiritually. Now, I've met some people that probably could do it doing the first one as well, but that's another thing. But what we do with our body affects our spirit and our mind. And this is why many times you see people that, that you know, go into promiscuity or pornography, these other things, they start having mental problems. Because what you do with your body will affect your mind. Okay? And so, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 here, speaking of the end times, and it says, but know this, the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal. I, I don't know if any of you have noticed a trend over the last number of years, particularly on social media, Seeing people behaving in the most brutal manner towards each other. Complete strangers just knocking each other out. And, and a, a very troubling uh, a trend of seeing young men hitting uh, young women. And uh, you, you know, it's, I believe it's an indication of the, the, the brutality um, uh, of these end days where people are just losing all respect for each other. I mean, people will say things to each other online now that they would never have said to somebody's face. And... Uh, but, but this is where I think we need to be mindful of the times that we're in. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying its power from such people turn away. I used to be impressed in my early days of being a believer when somebody said I'm a Christian. <clears throat> Today I'm not as impressed by somebody just simply saying that. I'm looking for fruit. Amen. Jesus said by their fruits. You will know them. Going to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger. Going into church doesn't make you a Christian. Are you living like you are a believer? Are you a sold out follower of Jesus Christ? Amen. And so. <laughs> hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3. Isaiah is given a glimpse of God's glory. And here we see that the seraphim cried out and said. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Because not just humility fasting brings us, it brings us to holiness. And three times it repeats that God is holy. And Isaiah was convicted of his unholiness and God touched his life. And uh, uh, Isaiah arises and, and he hears the voice of God for the first time. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. And I would probably add to that, without holiness, no man will hear the Lord. 
And Isaiah hears the voice of God saying, who will go for us? Who will we send? And he says, here am I. Send me. You see, Isaiah had such an encounter with the Lord that, that, you know, people refer to Isaiah as the fifth gospel. Because it's got so much of Jesus in it. It's got so much revelation of, of heaven in that book. And, and uh, I believe a lot of it was, was rooted in the fact that Isaiah had an encounter with the holiness of God. And as I went into in great detail last week, I believe the church needs to rediscover the holiness of God. But you see, it's as we fast, as we pray, that God will give us a new vision of who he is and how he wants us to live. Be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You see, as we fast, as we pray, the, the hold that the flesh and the things of the world has over us will be broken. Because God is holy and those who walk with him have to be holy too. Fasting, therefore, is a key element to us walking in humility and walking in holiness and walking in freedom. And the third one I, I wanted to get to today is sensitivity. Second Chronicles chapter 20. And it happened um, after that that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others beside them um, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then they came and told Jehoshaphat saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and there in uh, Hazrat Tamar, which is En Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And this is why, again, like I said, I'm believing you're going to receive personal breakthroughs, but I believe this is a time where we have to see breakthroughs with regards to our nations, with regards to who is running our nations, and regards to who are making decisions in Jesus' name. I'm not happy with the fact that they are ramming through, throughout the Western world, these radical sex education, um, uh, you know, uh, programs that, that are ultimately just, you know, demonic indoctrination. And will uh, sow so much confusion in the hearts of young people. And um, uh, this is where, again, we have to be on our faces in prayer and believing. And, and this is why Jehoshaphat called for a fast. Ezra called for a fast. And uh, again, we're fasting because we're believing to see change in our nation in Jesus' name. Amen. And not everybody may understand what I'm talking about. And that's, that, that's fine. But understand this. When you become a parent and when you see those impressionable little children, and, and you recognize that, you, you know, they're like wet concrete. And what is impressed upon them in their younger years will stay with them for the rest of their days. This is why we have to be in prayer. And we have to walk in the fear of God. So that's why God set me free. I'm not worried what people think about me or say about me. I want to obey God. I want to honor Him. And I'm going to proclaim His word without apology in Jesus' name. Because the word of God is truth. And this is why we have to be sensitive. And Jehoshaphat feared and uh, set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim the fast throughout all Judah. So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And they came before him and it says they brought their little ones with them. We got to bring our ch children with us on this journey in Jesus name. Verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. We, and we do not, nor do we know what to do. But our eyes are on you. Our eyes are upon you. And this is what we're doing when we fast. Is, is we're, we're, you know, stepping aside. And I know this is a Daniel fast. You're eating vegetables. But for some of you, you might as well be eating nothing. I, <laughs> last two weeks, I've been fighting a gagging reflex. Sometimes when I'm eating, oh, you're just like, Jesus. <laughs> anyway, let's keep moving. This, uh, uh, Jehoshaphat, fan, it's no disrespect to your cooking, sweetheart. I love your cooking. It's wonderful. You're such a wonderful cook. I, I, you're great. Um, sensitivity. Because there are times when we just have to hear from heaven. And in this crucial moment, King Jehoshaphat could have spent his time in mustering his army or, 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 you know, begging for help from foreign kings or even fleeing to save his own life. He, he didn't do any of those things. He called for a fast. You see, it's as we fast and pray that our hearts are opened to hear from heaven. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. 
The NIV, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. You see, my sheep hear and just as importantly, listen to my voice. Because just because somebody is hearing doesn't mean that they're listening to you. I mean, how many times have we said of somebody uh, who's determined to follow a certain course of action, they're listening to no one? Well, I wonder, is God looking down at us sometimes and saying the same thing? You see, Christ declared that hearing God's voice Hearing from God would be one of the key characteristics of his followers. He said his followers would be fishers of men. He said his followers would obey his voice. John 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do what I say. He said that they would walk in the light of his word. John 17 and verse 6. I've revealed uh, you to those whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours and you've given them to me and they've obeyed my word. So he said all of these things would characterize us, but he also added that they would hear his voice because it's not just sensitivity to God's voice, but to God's will. And this is why we must love the Bible and make time to read it daily because God's word and God's will are one. And if we're ignorant of God's word, we are ignorant of God's will. Isaiah 5 and 14, for the light makes everything visible. That's why it says, awake, O sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will give you light. You see, as the church, we must awaken to the times that we are living in. Romans 13, 11, And this do, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awaken out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of life. Thank you, Tesh. Thank you, Jesus. The day of Christ's return is at hand. Are you ready for his return? Luke chapter 21 and verse uh, 36. And it says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I remember studying end times 30 years ago and hearing about some of the things that are happening right now, particularly in regards to Europe and Russia and so many of these, you know, this, this whole surveillance state thing that is happening. Um, and, and back then, really, the technology didn't even exist to facilitate what they're doing today. And yet it does. And I believe we may be much closer to Christ's return than some of us might realize. Amen. But you know, we need to awaken like the Bible says. First Chronicles 12, 32. It says, of the sons of Isaac are who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200 and, uh, and their, all their brethren were at their command. It says the, the men of Isaac are had understanding of the times. Let me say this. Many believers don't go to church because they're asleep. Others don't go because they're awake and the local church is asleep. And that's another story. But all I can repeat is this. It's worth a drive for a church that's alive. I know that's an old cliche, but there's a certain truth to that. But you know, people give me all sorts of reasons why they can't go to church. I can't go to church because Sunday's my only day off and I have to sleep. Well, when you do finally awake, you may discover that we're gone and you're still here. Oh, pastor, I have to work. Well, are you working to live or are you living to work? Because Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. Uh, John 6, 27. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to life eternal, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father has set his seal. Have you neglected to feed your own soul? Or people might, another excuse people give is, oh, I have kids. <laughs> so have I, and I'm here. And fact is, we've been here for so many years. At one stage, we had five kids under the age of seven. I think we got a picture there. Oh, I miss those days. We had to get those kids out of bed, feed them, change them, get them dressed, get them into the car. But we went to church, not because we were pastors, but because we believe it's important. In spite of the crazy season we were in, and I miss those days so much. But, you know, we took them to church back then. And church is a part of who they are today. You see, Proverbs 20, 22 and 6, train up a child in the way in which they shall go. So people give all these excuses. Another excuse sometimes people, Sunday, I got to do my TikToks. <laughs> I, 
I don't even know where to answer there, but all I can say is this, is that if you're narcissistic, social media addiction is keeping you out of church, it's no different to being an addict to crack or alcohol. You need to repent and deal with that sin in Jesus' name. 1 Kings 19, and it says, The Lord says, Go out and stand in the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. Are you alert to the whispers of God? Because sometimes God doesn't shout. He whispers. Are you listening to his voice? Because if we are not sensitive, we can miss what God is saying to us. Again, my sheep listen to my voice. Fact is, if you're going to a good church where the pastor is proclaiming the word of God, many times the Lord will speak to you directly through the minister or the message. And yet, sadly, some people do not listen. Other people don't even go. I say this in all humility. I don't counsel people who don't go to church. I used to, but I discovered it's a waste of time. Because if you are coming, you will probably hear from God in the message. And if you're not, it doesn't matter anything that I say to you anyway, because you're already in disobedience. And I appreciate the natural flow of this world is to take you away from God and not to Him. But also bear in mind this, a dead body always flows downstream. And so, if you're always going back to your old ways, your old lifestyle, your old habits, it may be an indication that you need to get saved. See, God calls us to change. And, and, but the truth is this, even those who are faithful to church and are doing their best to serve Him, can begin to stray and drift in their walk with Him and become insensitive to His voice. And this is why fasting brings us back. It brings us back to his will and to his way. Joel 2.12. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. You see, prayer combined with fasting makes us more sensitive to the voice of God. And there is nothing better in life to hear than the sound of our father's voice. When our first child, Ewan, was born... Moments after he was born, he was roaring, crying. I was across the room. I was kind of... Keeping a safe distance. <laughs> it was my first baby, and you know, I wasn't sure what to do. I saw this little blondie little thing, and he was roaring, crying. And I remember across the room, I just said, hey, you, and it's okay, kid. And immediately he stopped crying, and he tried to turn his little head to see where my voice was coming from. Well, the nurse was a Christian. We knew her from, from church, and she was amazed. She said, I've never seen that in my life, you know, that uh, immediately he recognized the voice of his father, because how many of you know a child in the womb can hear your voice? And so he was already familiar with my voice. So when he heard it, suddenly it was something familiar and it gave him comfort and he wanted to hear the voice of his father. Well, you know, there's something on the inside of us wants to hear the voice of our father. Amen. There's something on the inside of us wants to hear the voice of our father. And so, you know, this is why I believe one of the reasons we come to church, because when we're hearing the word being preached, there's, there's something in us hearing something that's familiar, something that resonates on the inside. Deep calleth unto deep. Amen. And, um, and so anyway, I th thought it was just such a, a, a beautiful thing. Um, Charles Spurgeon, you will never know the fullness of Christ until you know the emptiness of everything everything else. Luke 5 and 17. We're talking about sensitivity. Now it happened on a certain day that he was teaching and there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, uh, Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. God knew that some of these Pharisees had needs or were sick. And yet there's no record that any of them were touched or healed in any way. You see, God had a blessing for them, but they weren't sensitive to it. And instead of coming before Jesus with a heart full of faith, they came before him with a head full of arguments. And they received nothing from him. Because just because God has something for you does not mean that you will receive it or walk in it. These men were utterly oblivious to the fact that God's power was present to meet their needs. 
This is sobering to consider because these were God-fearing men. They were learned, religious, devout, educated men, and yet they missed their moment with the master. In the very same way, I wonder if we could one day land on those heavenly shores and only there discover that there were miracles that God would have done blessings that we could have received you know miracles that we could have seen if only we had been sensitive to his voice and the leading of his spirit Luke 2 37 and there was a widow until she was 84 she had never left the temple but worshiped night and day fasting and praying you see when we fast we are sensitive and led by the Spirit of God. And he can, he can put us in the right place at the right time, just as he did with the prophetess Anna. Because God put her in that place where the long-awaited Messiah was to be presented as a baby. What if she decided, like so many other believers do on a Sunday morning, I'm too busy, I'm too stressed, I'm too tired, I'm too old, I'm too young. You snooze, you lose. Let me say this, you don't need a therapist, you don't need counseling, you just need to come into church and with an open heart, ready to receive from him in Jesus' name. Amen? Hallelujah. Because too many times people think, oh, uh, uh, I need a therapist or I need tranquilizer, or I need counseling. No, you just need to come into the presence of God's people. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten. Romans 8 and verse 14, as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Great. But how? One way is by fasting. It teaches us to be sensitive to the voice of God and to the leading of God because it shuts out the voice of our belly and eliminates the distraction of eating. It's amazing how much time you have when you're not actually eating. You know, Acts 17, 6, these people have come here who have turned the world upside down. The book of Acts chapter 13 and verse 1. You're talking about the disciples. Now in the church there was Antioch. There were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger. Lucius of Cyrene. Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted. I'm sure sometimes people sit here and say, will he ever finish? I was just reading uh, John uh, or George Whitfield's journals recently and he's talking about how one place he preached for an hour and a half you know Finney would sometimes preach for two hours if we want to see revival we're going to have to stop looking at our clocks and we're going to have to come ready to hear ready to engage ready to encounter the Lord but it says as they ministered to the Lord and fasted the Holy Spirit said I think it's interesting they said they ministered to the Lord too many of our songs minister to us. The question we need to ask, and if you're in worship, the question you need to ask is this. You don't ask, is this song ministering to me? Is this my favorite song? Is this what I want to sing? That's irrelevant. Is it ministering to him? Too many of our songs are about me. We're either singing about what God has done, or we're singing about ourselves. People writing songs about their feelings. And it's an indication of the generation that we're in. We're self-absorbed. You look at some of those old songs. They were simple. But the focus was completely on God. I'm not saying modern songs are wrong. But I'm just simply saying. We have to get back to ministering to Him. Where it is about Him. It's about Him. Not about your feelings. Not about your emotions. Not about what you think. I don't care what you think. I don't care about what I think. I care about what he thinks. Is it pleasing to him? As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit spoke in that environment. Are you coming to church with that attitude? Because the early church practiced fasting. We wonder what was the secret of their effectiveness. They turned the world upside down. Well, here we have it. They humbly waited on God and used the time to minister to Him by fasting and prayer. You see, fasting matters because we all have a strong desire to eat. Fact is, it's one of the strongest desires we have after breathing. But are you prayerful about your decisions? 
Are you fasting and praying? Because sometimes people make major decisions without ever fasting and praying or waiting on God. Let me say this. I appreciate some of you could take a job in this or that city or nation. But for the sake of five or 10 or 20,000 euros, in some instances, you're literally stepping out of light into darkness, so to speak. Because your associations and your environment aren't just important, they are vital. Do you know that, that, that a plant will live or die depending on what environment you put it in? And in the very same way, you will thrive or just survive based on where you go to church. Psalm 92, planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of their God. Do you know if you put a plant, a thriving plant, in a dark room, it will die. And yet this is exactly what many people do in the name of furthering their career or increasing their bank balance. And sadly, some even end up losing their marriage or, or their kids because they're now in a place where there is no church or a dead church and they backslide. You know, in humility, this is a good church and you can grow, but you have a part to play. Come faithfully every week. Get involved. Get on a team. You know, tithe, give. Go to Bible school. You know, don't, and let me say this. It's not necessarily going to happen overnight, but give us a year and your life will be changed. Could you give me five more minutes? We've looked at humility. We've looked at holiness. We've looked at sim sen sensitivity. And I want to deal very quickly with simplicity. 2 Corinthians 11 and 3. But I fear lest that by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds could be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know, Kari Ten Boom had advice for young ministers, and it was this, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, stupid. The gospel is simple. Don't overcomplicate it. I love the simplicity, like I said, of those old songs. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Come on, sing it. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Isn't that beautiful? God, you're so good. Come on, just sing it to the Lord. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. How many of you believe that? First Corinthians chapter one and verse 18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You see, it's foolishness to those who perish because it's too simple. You know, God so loved the world. A, a God who loves the souls of men and paid the ultimate price by dying on a cross in their place. And, and you only have to believe in order to receive forgiveness and eternal life. It's that simple, yes. The gospel is simple, but life changing. You know, last November, I was blessed to be able to go to um, Wales and I went to the chapel where uh, the, the, the great revival happened where Evan Roberts uh, was ministering and uh, there was a 90-year-old Welsh man showing me around the chapel and telling me the story. And he was such a wonderful man. His father had been Evan Roberts' worship leader. And one thing he kept telling me over and over again as he told me the story of Wales, over 100,000 people got saved in less than a year to the point where football matches and rugby matches were being cancelled because nobody was turning up, where the bars were closed because everybody was going to church. Come on. Glory to Jesus. I believe we're going to see those days again. But he kept saying one phrase over and over and over. He kept talking about the, the pure gospel. He used to say, the pure gospel. Like, I can't even do the Welsh accent. It was beautiful. The pure gospel. Because you know why? 
There is a potency in purity and simplicity. Fact is, the most profound change begins with a simple step. Like deciding to go on a fast, like we're doing. For me, it's a reminder to go back to our original mission statement, to be a Christ-centered church with a Christ-centered message. Because if the cross isn't at the center, then we have strayed from the call. Because the cross speaks of sacrifice and service and suffering. Mark 16. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. But how could something that was a symbol of suffering and pain and defeat and domination end up becoming a symbol of hope and, and healing and, 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 and uh, victory? You know, the very thing that symbolizes our faith. I mean, you can wear a cross and people immediately know that you are a follower of Christ. You see, Jesus took our place on the cross, bearing our sin so that we could be forgiven and so that we could be free. And so if you believe, you can be made new. You can be saved. It's a simple message, but it's a life-changing one. It will change your life. It's a simple message, but a profound message. And so when we embrace the gospel in its simplicity, it changes everything. And until we do, it changes nothing. Doesn't matter how much knowledge you have. If you haven't embraced the gospel in its simplicity, it changes nothing in your life. And maybe this is one reason why so many converts are frustrated or angry or surprised because we didn't warn them that the cross calls us to die. Die to sin, die to self, die to the desires and ambitions of this world, die to the fear of man. You see, the cross tells us of a God who loves us and calls us to love. A God who understands suffering, having suffered himself. A God who saw the cost of purchasing our souls and yet didn't blink. And a God who now sends us with his life and his love to a broken world. You know, I so appreciate every one of you that, you, you know, Liam and, and, and Rang and every one of you to go to the street every week to minister the gospel. Because there's so many people who are broken, who are lost. And who need to hear this message. Because God sends us with his love and I appreciate love makes us vulnerable. It's always easier to keep people at a distance. You know, play it safe and, and be cynical. But God calls us to love. Amen? And, and it's always, like I said, it, it's always easier to, to just, just never let people get too close. But you know, ultimately, if you're not loving, you're not living. We're called to love and be loved. Now we know what love is as the worship group come forward. Now we know what love is because while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. And it says in 1 John 3, 16, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. Revelation 2, 4. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You've left your first love. You see, fasting brings us back to the simplicity of the gospel. Fasting brings us back to our first love. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Do you know that Jesus Christ loves you? This fast has not been about making anybody suffer or, you know, imposing legalism on anybody. And, and you know what? The last week, if you haven't done it, you can join us for the last seven days. But this fast is about us simply, just like my son, turning our heads so that we can hear the voice of our Father. You see, we love because we're loved. We forgive because we have been forgiven. And you see, it's love that draws us back into God's presence. And if, if you don't have one of these, just put your hand up and the ushers will get you one. Because this is the reality. Sometimes we can be working for God and yet not walking with God. That's what fasting is about. It's, it's not about the food. It's not about your belly. It's about your heart. Fasting helps us to reconnect with our Creator. And this fast and this whole series has been simply about us turning our heads so that we can hear the voice of our Father, so that we can reconnect with Him. 
who loved us and died for us and desires for us to know him. You see, it's a very simple message. And this is why Christ didn't give us a complicated ritual to remember his sacrifice. He just simply said to take bread and to take wine and to remember the price that was paid for our soul. So today, as we take up the bread, we remind that the healing belongs to us. And if you're sick in your body, you just take that healing in Jesus' name. Healing belongs to you. Healing is the children's bread. God wants you well. He doesn't want you sick. He doesn't want you to die young. With long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. So as we eat of the bread today, we're reminded that by your stripes we were healed. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of your sins. Do this in memory of me. I think I've lost my strength after the fasting. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Don't have to give me another one, darling. Thank you, sweetheart. Thanks, Hitesh. Look at that big muscular Indian. Bless you. <laughs> Lord, if you take the cup, you know, I know there's people here today, and maybe you got addictions or iniquities. Or issues maybe you've been struggling with for years. And you've tried. You've tried to get free and each time you fail. Today we bring those weaknesses, those failures, those sins, those habits, those bondages. Even those memories. Because some of you, it's, you've been dragging that weight with you for years. That memory of that abuse. Or that failure. Or that hurt. That bereavement. That divorce. Whatever. Do you know your father sees you and he says, child, behold, I make all things new. Today, it's time to just let it go. Let go of the hurt. Let go of the bitterness. Let go of the memories. Because you know what? There's things in every one of our lives that we will be shamed to acknowledge. Where we have been or what we have done or what we have said or what we thought or what we yielded to. But as we look at the cross, we're reminded of the blood that was shed to cleanse us from all sin. It's a simple message, but tremendously profound to recognize we don't deserve it. We don't deserve to be forgiven. We don't deserve to be cleansed, but that is what exactly what grace did. God's grace is offered towards us. And so as we drink of this cup, we're reminded that your blood was shed, Jesus, to cleanse us from sin and to break every chain. And so today, Lord God, as we drink of this cup, we not only receive forgiveness, we receive cleansing, we receive deliverance, we receive forgiveness, we receive freedom in the mighty name of Jesus. Could we stand to our feet today? Can we just sing that chorus that you're playing there, Jason? I believe you're my healer. Lord, we just thank you for healing right now in this place in the name of Jesus. Healing and wholeness in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord God. We're in your presence and you're not finished, Lord. You're going to do miracles in this place. Just lift your hands as a sign of surrender. Praise God. Come on. I believe.